Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 34th annual Great Lakes Day. Great Lakes Day is sponsored by Michigan Sea Grant, Michigan State University Institute of Water Research, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, and MSU Extension as a part of ANR Week at Michigan State University. My name is Angela Scapini, and I'll be your MC for the day. Up first, we have Carolyn Foley with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant presenting PFAS in the Great Lakes. Ms. Foley is a research coordinator with Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Her main job is managing funding competitions and supporting researchers who studied Lake Michigan. As a researcher, she has authored more than 20 peer-reviewed publications in journals such as Science of the Total Environment, Climate Change, and the Journal of Great Lakes Research. She is currently managing a grant intended to explore social and economic impacts of PFAS in the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain regions. Please welcome Ms. Foley. Great, thank you, Angela. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, so I, as Angela mentioned, I'm the research coordinator for Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. I am far from a expert on PFAS, but through my work, I'm able to help support research that's happening, um, uh, looking at PFAS and all of the related compounds in the Great Lakes. Um, so you don't need to guess which uh, literacy principle this talk addresses. It's much remains to be learned about the Great Lakes. And this is just the short version of what I'm going to talk about in my talk. PFAS, PFOAs, and related compounds are present in waterways and fish in the Great Lakes region. Um, it is potentially problematic for human and ecosystem health, but it's not clear which exposure route is the most critical. There is a lot of work happening right now. There are many, 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 many groups who are um, tackling this very, very important issue. So there will be revisions over time as people learn more because that's how the best science works. So I wanted to take a step back and say, what is a contaminant of emerging concern? Um, or a CEC, which is a term you may hear. It is a chemical or material for which there are perceived potential or real threats to human health or the environment, or it's a chemical or material for which there is a lack of published health standards. Something really, really important is the emerging part of contaminant of emerging concern doesn't mean that a contaminant necessarily has just been produced recently. It may have been produced for quite a long time, but new information that scientists are gathering suggests that there's a threat associated with it. And this is the case for, for PFAS and PFOAs. So what are PFAS? They're per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, so these are a couple of different... Um, examples of their chemical structure, and these Fs all around the fluorine, that's what they have in common. Common, But they represent a group of nearly 15,000 manufactured compounds. They've been used in products since the 1950s, and they were originally introduced to, to make people's lives easier because their properties, their chemical properties, allow them to resist heat, oil, grease, and water. Um, so these are just a couple of different terms that you may hear, PFOA, PFAS, uh, Gen X, PFBS. Um, some of them are a longer chain um, PFAS that that'll come up a little bit later when I'm talking about some of the data. Um, and then some of them are shorter chain. Um, by and large, they are highly stable and persistent in the environment. So they have been termed the forever chemicals. Some... Um, Chemists don't like that term because they actually do break down eventually, but they do they stick around for quite a while before they do so. So how are they used? It's a little bit more like how have they not been used, but it's a lot of different products. Um, a major one is film forming foam to, to fight fires, uh, nonstick cookware and utensils, stain repellent carpets, upholstery and other fabrics, grease or oil resistant food packaging and containers, stain and water repellent apparel, dental floss, polishes, paint sealants and waxes, personal care products and cosmetics, and cleaning products. So these are all um, just an example of all of the places that you may be exposed to PFAS or where PFAS were introduced into a product. 
PFAS as a, as a problem. Um, the presence of PFAS in the environment, even though they had been being used since like the 1950s, it was not widely reported until the late 1990s to early 2000s. So maybe, you know, uh, 40 to 50 years later. The PFAS and all of this related compounds, and when I'm talking about PFAS right now, it's all of them. They, they can be ingested, absorbed through skin, and inhaled, and they can be readily absorbed in the digestive tract and enter the bloodstream. Uh, there's also a host of possible negative health effects associated with PFAS exposure. Um, PFAS can be broken down in humans by our bodies, but it happens slowly. Um, but a couple of things that are really important to keep in mind is the dose varies with the exposure route and the total dose is key. So you're being exposed to PFAS from a variety of sources and it's the total dose overall that would potentially lead to some risks. The type of PFAS would also affect associated risks. So this is an extremely challenging issue, which is why it's really good that there are many, many, many different groups trying to tackle it. In the U.S., the EPA's approach to PFAS, they generated a roadmap. They wanted to consider the entire life cycle of PFAS, considering their unique properties, the fact that they're used in many different ways, and there are multiple pathways for exposure. They're trying to get upstream of the problem and actually hold polluters accountable, ensuring science-based decision-making and prioritizing protection of disadvantaged communities, because um, in a lot of times, contamination disproportionately affects um, disadvantaged communities. So in April 2023, uh, a major milestone was reached where the EPA actually generated primary drinking water regulation goals um, for these, you know, six compounds that are related to, to PFAS. And so these maximum contaminant levels this was really, really important for the EPA to come out with this guidance because at that point, local jurisdictions and state jurisdictions now had a target to aim for so they could then try to enforce with things like removal technologies and stuff like that. Um, around the same time in April 2023, Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, as part of a grant that was looking more at the social side of PFAS exposure, brought together a bunch of, um, of experts we are, again, not the only group doing this, and I think it's very good that we are not the only group doing this because this is an extremely tricky issue. We asked them to tell us what the, um, the most important sources and exposure routes they felt were, and so the top three were ingestion through food and water, inhalation through air and dust, and dermal exposure, so like touching consumer products. But this is a word cloud where the bigger uh, a word is, the more often it turned up. And I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, fish and hunting wildlife, fish intake, fish tissue and hunting wildlife did come up as a potential source, um, which is something that's in extremely important to Great Lakes groups. Um, drinking water and food and water ingestion was one that was a little bit more uh, attentive. And then there's this whole host of groups like agricultural waste, contaminated runoff, biosolids, industrial waste. So this is one of the um, trickier spots to, to treat, but also if you can identify where the PFAS are coming from, maybe you do have some places where you can get it. I did want to draw your attention to the fact that at least one person said the PFAS sources and exposure routes are everything. So I think one audience member at one point said to me, we live in a contaminated world and that is accurate. Um, so we wanna be aware, but that doesn't mean we shut everything down and we don't try to tackle it. So PFAS have been found in the Great Lakes in sediments, water, and fish. Um, the rest of my talk, I'm going to try to take you through some studies that have been, and I'm going to focus mostly on fish because that's what I know the most about. Um, something to note, though, is that, again, it's like 15,000 compounds and then the PFAS breaking down and things like that. It's a huge, huge class of chemicals where the different ones may have different um different exposures, different doses, like different problems, different endpoints. Um, there's also different ways to analyze the PFAS samples. Uh, so there are some consistencies from lab to lab, but, th but sometimes you can choose to analyze just one PFAS or like a subset. Sometimes you can choose to analyze a whole bunch. It's also extremely expensive to sample for PFAS. And so a lot of the studies that I'm going to share, they have a pretty small sample size just because it, it costs a lot of money. 
So this is an example um, of a study that looked at PFAS in sediments in the upper Great Lakes, so Lake Superior, Michigan, and Huron. In this particular figure, a, a bigger circle means more a higher concentration of PFAS. And mostly what I wanted to draw your attention to here is that it, it's not super clear that, you know, it happens always near um near in like places where lots of people live or things like that. Oops, sorry. Um, so I believe this one right here, H118, was near the um, uh, military base. And so that's, so it, it's very highly spati spatially variable. Um, this is the same group that looked at PFAS and sediments in the lower Great Lakes. And so this time a, a higher bar means more PFAS, and so there are some places where there are really big spikes, but then you can have like in Western Lake Erie here, um, some relatively higher spikes and then some right next to it, spots right next to it that are relatively low. So again, they are highly, highly spatially variable. Um, this is a study that looked at PFAS plus other contaminants of emerging concern in Lake St. Clair and along the Detroit River. And so these little pie pieces sort of show the distribution of the, the different types of contaminants they were, they were taking a look at there. Um, they looked at, they did find 12 PFAS and two branched isomers in the surface water or sediment samples, but unlike the pharmaceutical and personal care products and pesticides, so PPCP is pharmaceutical and personal care product, um, PFAS weren't detected consistently. So like if you look at these pie pieces, PFAS is purple, and there's only a couple of sites where you see PFAS, whereas you see a number of sites that have this yellow pesticides. So that's the other thing is that there's, there's a a mixture of, of contaminants. Um, PFAS uh, do occur in fish. They can persist for long periods and can bioaccumulate to high levels. Um, they can be passed from female salmon to the salmon's eggs. You can be exposed to PFAS by consuming contaminated fish. And PFAS, unfortunately, some contaminants, you can sort of remove the contaminant by preparing the fish a certain way. That's not the case for PFAS. Um, if you look at PFAS in fish in the Great Lakes, if you Google that right now, you will find lots and lots and lots of studies, uh, sorry, stories, stories about this particular study that came out in early 2023, um, where they were looking at, they were saying that um, consuming uh, Great Lakes fish was like highly, highly contaminated with PFAS. Um, so one thing that I really hope you take away is that science is about more than one study. And even within this study, there's a lot of variation. So, um, so I'm going to, again, walk through this study a little bit and then a couple of other ones too. So this is a figure from that first study where along the y-axis you have like the total amount of PFAS that they found in the fish tissue. And then along the x you have three different sources. So some fish were collected through the EPA National Rivers and Streams Assessment, some fish through the Great Lakes Human Health Study, and some were commercial fish samples. And you can see that the the possibilities are, are higher here. So one thing I want to point out is these numbers are way, way higher than other studies. It's largely because of the units they chose to express them in. And if you standardize them for the units, it looks more consistent across different studies. Um, but here you can see that there's a lot of variation within these samples of fish. Um, and you have some that actually had very few to, to no PFAS. If we look at another figure from that study, along this axis here, we have different species. And along the Y, the amount of PFAS. And each one of these dots is like an individual fish. You could look at, say, Chinook salmon. Um, and even the individual fish are, you know, some of them have pretty low levels of PFAS and some of them are really high. If you look down here at channel catfish, it's even more variable. So I think this reinforces the idea that um, like PFAS levels are, are super, super variable, and it probably has more to do, what I've heard mostly is that it has more to do with location rather than something to do with like the food web. I'll share a couple of more things around that. Um, one thing that seems to be common is that those PFOS or long chain ones seem more common to be found in Great Lakes fish across a variety of studies, but those are actually being phased out in industry. So over time, there's a hope that their contamination levels will go down in the fish tissue. Um, the Great Lakes um, Fish Monitoring and Surveillance Program analysis of long-term trends of a whole host of contaminants has shown that some PFAS are decreasing in different areas. 
Lake Superior and Erie seemed the most stable or increasing, and they linked that to activity along the shoreline or um, use of biosolids on land. So again, it's kind of like a, a local source of PFAS that are potentially being introduced. And this is a map just of the locations where those the EPA's long-term monitoring um, program, where they happen. So um, just so you could see that. There was another study where they looked at a variety of fish species and looked at different pieces of the fish. So um, this is uh, in, in the middle of Michigan, so it's not the Great Lakes proper, but it's local waterways. Um, and so they looked at kind of within a single fish, the guts, the liver, fillets, and their eggs. And so in the 11 fillets that they analyzed, they did find detection levels of those long chain PFO PFOSs. Um, some, uh, most of them were kind of higher than the recommended dose, uh, but then you also have you know, one fillet that it's not detectable. Um, and the amount in the fillets was lower. It, it's still too high, but it was lower than other parts of the fish like the liver or, or the guts. And then this is a study that um, we actually supported through Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, where they were looking at a whole bunch of different fish in Lake Michigan. And with other contaminants, you sort of think that the, the top level predators, um, like the salmon and the lake trout, it's sort of like they have the highest contamination level, but that was not what the researchers found. So here we have the total amount of PFAS again and different species. Um, and actually the salmon are kind of right in the middle in terms of their contamination levels. Um, um, the slimy sculpin and deep water sculpin were, were a lot higher and they're trying to figure out what that mechanism is. One thing that is important about this study is that they did detect PFAS in every fish that they looked at. So that's potentially concerning and a reason to take, to take action. Um, and then this is a study uh, from Lake Huron um, that looked at a variety of different groups of the, the food web. And in this study, lake trout were actually a little bit higher in terms of their PFAS concentrations than some of the other species or the invertebrates. So um, PFAS don't necessarily move through the food web exactly the same way, which again makes them, them challenging to understand. Um, there has been a little bit of work done on humans who eat fish and like do the PFAS sort of transfer over. So specifically PFAS in humans who eat Great Lakes fish. Um, this is a study where they were looking at a, a bunch of different PFAS compounds and then they had people, they, they took their blood um, and analyzed them. And then they also had people report like how many fish did you eat or how much fish did you eat? And they found that there was some evidence that eating more fish leads to more of those long chain PFAS in the blood serum of individuals, but they acknowledged with their data um, that the data were collected in the mid 2000s. So if cleanup works, cleanup efforts and phasing out of contaminants is working, um, then you would expect that to go down over time. They also acknowledged that there are biases with human reporting, like when you're self-reporting, um, you may not be reporting entirely accurately. Um, this is a study out of Wisconsin where they looked at PFAS in humans who eat local fish. So again, it's kind of um, close to the Great Lakes. Um, they found that seven different PFAS were detected in at least 30% of the participants. And again, the highest levels were those, those long chain PFOS. Um, but they didn't find clear associations with fish consumption and PFAS, with the exception of like a, a couple of, um, of specific chemical compounds that were connected to both locally caught and restaurant perspectives fished. This is uh, one final study that um, they were looking at a variety of contaminants in uh, Anishinaabe tribes and fishing. And um, they actually found that, you know, mercury tissue burdens increased in white, lake whitefish and lake trout, PCB burdens decreased, um, but PFAS, they didn't really see that many of concern. So again, there are a lot of different organizations that are, are studying and monitoring and learning more. Um, and so it, it seems like it's a highly local issue. And so paying attention to local advisories is really, really important. Um, so several states do have fish consumption guidelines. This is just one example um, in Michigan where you can kind of look at the specific thing. So I think one of the takeaways is if you like to fish um, and you like to eat Great Lakes fish, then, you know, following the fish consumption guidelines, it seems uh, 
important. Um, there's also lots and lots of monitoring data. Again, this is an example from Michigan, but if you Google your home state or tribe or uh, province, or you will probably find some kind of monitoring data that will let you know about kind of how much PFAS is in your area. This is one final study I wanted to share where they're actually trying, this is very, very, very cool. They're actually trying to break down um, kind of the PFAS that they're finding where might they be coming from? And the reason that I think this is very, very cool is because this type of information will help with cleanup. And so I did not talk at all about um, cleanup, but there are lots and lots of really, really awesome technologies that are being developed to try to help remove PFAS from various ways. Um, strongly encourage you all to learn more. This is just a tiny, tiny piece. Um, there's the Great Lakes PFAS Summit, and actually this link, I'll try to make sure Angela has it. Um, there's a bunch of recordings from last year about some of those technologies that are really, really neat. Um, there's the Great Lakes PFAS Action Network. Again, I focused on the, the U.S. side, um, but there's lots of state-level action, lots of tribal action, lots of provincial action. Um, and there are drinking water standards being set and they will be revised as people learn more. Um, so the short version of my talk revisited, um, PFAS, PFOAs, and related compounds are present in waterways and fish in the Great Lakes region. This is potentially pro problematic for human e ecosystem health, but it's not clear which exposure route is the most critical. Um, there's a lot of work happening right now. It's a very, very exciting time. We have a lot of great scientists and uh, managers and everybody working on it. But also, there's more than one study that will look at any aspect of PFAS. So, you know, like, I encourage you to go out and, and learn more, and there will be revisions um, down the line. So with that, I'd like to thank um, uh, Amanpreet Kohli. Sarah Zach and Gavin Dennert, who helped compile the information for this talk. Um, our, my contact information is there on the screen. I think I'm meant to answer questions in the Q&A, so I will do my best to do that. And thank you all for joining me. And yeah, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Ms. Foley, for that.